it's 2.15, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for joining us today for the third in our ongoing Ask the Safety Partners Expert webinar series. Today's session will be moderated by Jennifer Riley, our President and Chief Operating Officer, and will be featuring Caroline Slater, our Director of Quality Research and Training. She'll be answering your questions about returning to work in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, for those of you who may not know Caroline, she has almost three decades of lab experience as a research scientist and an EHS consultant. And in her role as the head of quality research and training, she ensures the consistency and quality of safety partners work by overseeing all aspects of knowledge management and best practices for our programs and trainings. Caroline and her team regularly conduct research into emerging and changing regulations. They train both clients and safety partner staff on regulations and safety standards. If you have any questions for Caroline that you'd like to get into the queue now, get those in front of Jennifer's eyes, um, now or at any time during the session, please submit them by using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. A transcript of the call will be created and shared. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, the information provided on this webinar does not and is not intended to constitute legal advice or medical advice. All information is for general informational purposes only. Information on this webinar is as up to date as of today, May 7th, 2020, and may not constitute the most up to date information after May 7th, 2020. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the content of this webinar are hereby expressly disclaimed. And none of the safety partner staff in any way whatsoever can be responsible for your use of the information discussed today. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Jennifer um, and, and we'll get Caroline answering questions. Uh, great. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for calling in. I hope everyone is, is staying well and uh, managing during this really trying, unprecedented time. So we'll start out with a question. Um, I'm sure you've all been really monitoring all the information that's being put out there. Every day there's a new email with new updates to information, and, and OSHA has put out some guidance and a, a particular document that talks about preparing the workplaces for COVID-19. And this document particularly highlights um, determining worker risk and exposure to the SARS-CoV virus. So Caroline, can you describe the classifications that OSHA described in this document, an example of jobs that would fall into those different classification categories? Sure, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so OSHA recommends a uh, exposure risk assessment for workers, and they have uh, classified the job description in four different categories. Um, there's a very high category, a high category, a medium, and a low category based on potential exposure uh, to the virus in the workplace. Um, some of the classification for the very high um, is about the risk of being high in the workplace or being exposed to COVID-2, and that would include healthcare worker working directly with patients, uh, who are positive, uh, lab worker collecting sample from patients, and also uh, lab employees working directly with the material and uh, potentially, uh, you know, generating aerosol in the procedure. Uh, the, ver the high risk of exposure um, is for support healthcare worker, for example, and support staff in a healthcare setting, uh, medical transport personnel. The medium exposure risk um, is when, for example, workers, um, you know, there might be some lab work going on at the facility with uh, COVID positive samples. Um, the other workers who are not working directly with that material, but are in contact with other employees who are working with that material. Uh, and anyone who may come in contact with someone who's potentially uh, positive and they you know, they have to work within six feet of that person, for example, or in area where there's a high, um, you know, community transmission of the virus. The low exposure risk apply to uh, people who perform like um, administrative duties, for example, or 
um, you know, if a company is working with the virus doing research, people who are not working near where the virus is used or not working where uh, next to workers who are working with the virus. So th those are the four classifications. Well, great. That's very helpful as, you know, companies look to classify their employees as OSHA, you know, needs them to do and requires them to do. So, so is it fair to say that most of the life science companies in, you know, R&D activities that do not involve COVID research would fall into that lower risk category? That's correct. Most of a life science company would fall under the low, lower risk exposure. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we'll turn to some questions that have come in from the from the audience. Um, you know, as again, companies are looking to manage the office space and and companies that are already having issues of lack of desk space within that office even before the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, do you have any suggestions on how they can adhere to social distancing when they start to return to this already crowded office space? That's a good question, especially since in the past several years, uh, companies have moved to a more open configuration space in their office. Um, you know, people are st have started to buy uh, those plexi shield, plexiglass shield, or they call sneeze guard in some cases to separate the workstation. Um, there might be a way also to move the furniture around to improve the flow and also make natural barriers between desks. Uh, and the companies that make furniture for office space are already started to sell different tools uh, to, you know, provide as much distance of physical separation as possible. And what about, I guess, companies might also think about um, rotating staff so that it's, you know, less density in the, those already crowded office spaces, if that's possible. I'm not sure if, you know, is that something that you're seeing clients are thinking about? Yes, if people can still work at home, let's say their you know, duties and for more administrative work, they're still working at home. Uh, some companies have moved to two shifts, one in the morning, like a six to noon, and then one afternoon one to kind of provide some distancing and the, the lower the density in the workplace, uh, in an office setting and also in the labs. Right. So, um, <clears throat> We're seeing many companies look to put um, either medical questionnaires when they come on site or temperature scanning. But what protocol do you recommend for someone that comes into work in the office and then, you know, later on in the day they start to exhibit symptoms after they've started working? I think it's important to communicate with the staff about, uh, you know, what to do in these types of cases where someone might be feeling good in the morning and then not good in the afternoon and to return home and talk to their, you know, supervisor and HR about their symptoms, and um, they should probably consult also, the, you know, with a medical uh, professional. So, how about shared restrooms? I know we're trying to look at all, you know, all aspects of facilities, but what, you know, what are you seeing clients thinking about in, in general recommendations for shared restrooms? So, what I've seen is uh, some clients are restricted. Uh, each restroom to one person, even if there are many stalls. So some clients have a procedure where uh, they have a sign on the door and people have to knock and if someone in there, they have to wait. Um, some other places they have put, uh, you know, let's say you have three stalls, they put one in between saying out of order signage and that's how they manage it. Mm -hmm. And how about other shared spaces like lunch areas, coffee areas? Uh, some companies have used signage for that, you know, like uh, they've looked at the conference room and decide, okay, in order to have like more spacing, we cannot allow more than a certain number of people in there and put signage on the door, removing chairs so that, you know, to prevent possibly having, you know, people be too concentrated uh, in a kitchen, for example, the same way, removing chairs or even taping the floors where the chair should be. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, besides signage and taping and training and communication with employees, there's a lot of ways mm. to manage that. There's going to be lots of uh, physical color-coded reminders, I'm sure, as employees get back into the workplace. Um, so thinking about the current options for uh, testing and regarding testing and what testing tells us, you know, any suggestion on how companies should think about building their policies around testing and testing results of employees? 
testing is becoming very complicated. Um, the guidance is continually changing and some companies are already offering antibody testing. Uh, and, and we don't know yet what that means. We don't know if the texts are good. There's so many different companies offering that. So I think the jury is still out on that. Yeah. So I just want to remind participants that might have joined after the initial um, opening remarks that you can feel free to ask questions by using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, pop those questions in and you can uh, make sure they get in front of Caroline. So. Uh, another question is, is how we should think about companies uh, who have a remote workforce, remote sales force, for example, or workers that go on site to clients to, you know, to service um, the equipment. What so this is, oh, go ahead. <laughs> that's a very good question. It's been coming up. Uh, we do have clients who have sales force that are working in other states where, you know, the guidance, the ordinance may be slightly different and some states are opening up. So I think it's important for employers to look at that, at, you know, their employees get going elsewhere and to have a minimum of, you know, like a face covering at least. Um, some of them are visiting a physician, you know, like sales force. Um, and then the discussion about how do you manage, for example, signing a pad, a signature pad when you, you know, the doctor is ordering something. So it's important to evaluate workers that are not working at your facility. They may be working also at an outside uh, animal care facility. They may be visiting CRO, CMO. So it's something to consider to make sure that employees, when they're going offsite, they are in a safe working environment also. You know, I'm not sure if it's too early to tell yet, but if in uh, employers do have these remote sales force that are going or you know other parts of the country are we seeing pretty consistent practices from state to state or is it still again, too early to tell I think it's too early to tell but uh, well we know already that some states uh, are not as strict in their procedures some you know are returning to work you know like uh, hairdresser in the gyms and, and everything um, you know all, all the other type of businesses so I think it's too early to tell but you know, I think uh, it's worth looking at, you know, if you have employees going in other states to look at the policies, uh, the procedure, what's in place there, what are the requirements if they have to wear face covering in public, for example. But uh, if they are visiting doctor's office and hospital, I'm assuming these facilities have very strict procedure in place already. Right, right. So back to the, um, you know, the area of, of doing testing at work or ask or doing health questionnaires and temperature testing, you know, can you speak a little to the, everyone knows about HIPAA regulations and privacy while, you know, sharing potential positive at work. So could you, you know, outline some of the things that companies need to think about when they're you know, gathering this information? So the, they do have to keep the answers uh, private, uh, you know, so uh, whatever they're gathering the information and writing those documents should be kept, you know, maybe with HR. Um, if they are asking the questions verbally, uh, there should be some sort of private area where the person can answer the question for those questionnaires. There's a lot of guidance also available for questions. Um, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Were you asking also about the temperature taking? Right, and just in general, how you, you know, you keep that information private, but you know, the need to, to know that information right now and, and how that makes you know, people feel more comfortable that they know that the, the company is, is looking out for the employees and having these procedures in place. Yeah. Um, so I think we've all been bombarded with, you know, various emails and advertisements about purchasing cleaning equipment used, you know, for disinfection, whether it's foggers or those electrostatic uh, devices. Do you recommend that companies buy their own equipment and you know, start doing this type of fogging or cleaning on a more routine basis. So that's a good question. And foggers, uh, to, you know, to disinfect the, the 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 space already exists, and they are used, for example, in a manufacturing setting to make sure that there's no living microorganism that could contaminate uh, a product. For example, in manufacturing, it it's sometimes used also in in an animal facility, especially at the beginning during commissioning and also in case of an outbreak of disease among the animal colony. But now it's showing up uh, because of the pandemic 
And so what it does, it, it will disinfect, you know, the surfaces when, you know, the air and then the surfaces when it we deposit it's the, the disinfectant the deposit on surfaces. But if the surfaces are not clean or disinfected, it may not reach to that layer of the surface. Um, also, I think it may provide a false sense of security because when you fog, let's say you fog in the evening, then the space is nice and clean and it gets into the cracks and disinfect everything. But the next morning when someone goes in into the space and if the person is asymptomatic and has COVID-19 and the first thing the person does is uh, talk or, or laugh and suddenly the virus may be, you know, the, she might, the person may be shedding the virus and the space, you know, again, might be contaminated. These droplets will be deposited on surface. So I think it's important to disinfect the common touch surface. Um, you know, I know that fogging will give people peace of mind, but um, I think it's not doing a whole lot, you know, it's, it's effective, but it, mm -hmm. the surface will be contaminated right away as soon as someone goes in. Um, as far as buying them, I mean, some of them are not very expensive, um, but again, it, I think it provides a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. and, and remember that the virus doesn't live very long on surfaces. So, you know, over the weekend, when you come back on Monday, they may not be that, you know, much virus left on the surface after two to three days. So what do you recommend that companies do when they've, you know, had an employee come on site, then they've been identified as being cause, uh, positive for the virus? You know, what should their next steps be? The current guidance is if you find out someone was positive and it's been more than seven days, you don't need to do any special cleaning. Um, if you've, it's been less than seven days, the recommendation is you should leave the, the whatever room the person was in um, unoccupied for 24 hours and then you come back and you clean and disinfect the surfaces after 24 hours and it's fine to re-enter mm -hmm. the space, those specific rooms. Right, okay. So of course we can't have a, a Q&A session uh, this week with masks being um, ordered you know, by the governor yesterday going into effect without some questions about masks. So now that they're mandatory, um, you know, are you seeing companies let their employees now bring their own masks in? Are you seeing them standardize more to issuing masks? Um, and you know, should should we recommend that companies inspect masks if employees come in with their own masks? So could you speak a little bit about that? So I think a lot of companies are just allowing people to, you know, make their own, bring their own, like the one that I have here. Um, and I think it's good for everyone to inspect their mask to make sure the elastic band is in good shape, you know, um, the mask is in good shape. I think it would be difficult for the employers to physically touch the mask, but educating the employees about uh, the mask. Um, some employers may be providing those surgical masks if you can find them, uh, but that's an option as well. The N95 should be reserved for either healthcare worker or work-related hazard. Let's say you have an animal facility, someone has allergies, uh, that's, they should be wearing something like this. Um, I know that people want to go to this, uh, but these are, first, they're difficult to get, but they're very difficult to breed. Um, you know, I, I have a few, and the last time I used one in January for sending, uh, after 30 minutes, uh, it was really hard to breathe. So they're not easy to breathe. I would not recommend people wear this in an office setting, definitely. Mm -hmm. But it's good to inspect, inspect your mask when you're going to wear it to make sure it's in good shape. And once it's something is soiled, uh, this should be disposed of. When it's soiled, uh, these also should be washed, the face cloth, the the cloth mask, they should be washed with soap and water after use. Mm -hmm. And so how, um, how should companies deal with their employees who are working in the lab environment and now they're going between the lab environment wearing a mask and the office environment wearing a mask and do you change masks, leave it in the lab? You know, what are you seeing the trend of, of companies going with in, in the best recommendation? So if it's disposable, that's a little bit of an easy answer to dispose of it. Uh, if it's a cloth mask, so um, my feeling is when you wear a cloth mask, um, usually in the lab there's no reason for this to be contaminated with workplace hazard. Uh, because if, um, if, I, if this is contaminated, that means uh, 
usually, you know, if we're talking about before we were wearing this, if my mask is contaminated by workplace hazard, that means in, in general, my mouth would be contaminated with workplace hazards. So I would be very concerned if, you know, um, so, you know, I don't think necessarily there's a, um, I don't think it's really important to change those when you get out, in and out of the lab as long as this is not contaminated with like chemical hazard, biological hazard. Uh, there may be a reason to, if, depending on the work you're doing in a tissue culture room at BSL2, maybe BSL2 plus, and maybe in that case you need a different type of mask if it's to protect you against workplace hazard. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you have several masks, I mean, what you don't want to do is, is keep removing and putting your mask back on because every time, every time you bring your hand next to your face, there's a potential for contamination and you're not supposed to touch that outside part. So the more you handle your mask and what do you do, you know, if you were to change it, just do you leave one in the lab and now it can potentially be contaminated with, you know, other kind of other types of a hazard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's no standard for companies that they have to put certain procedures in place. So, you know, we're seeing a, a wide variety of companies, you know, going through this risk assessment process and protecting employees and deciding what they want to put in place. So can you speak to what you're seeing that's not working? Um, that maybe is just not, you know, that people have tried to put in place and just really uh, some sage advice that already we're experiencing? <laughs> Yes, <clears throat> glove in the office. So I know everybody's worried about touching surfaces. And so glove in the office, first, it's not, it wouldn't be very easy to type on the computer and things like that. And people are worried about their hands. But uh, when people are wearing gloves in the office, then they're less aware um, and there's more chance for cross contamination. So they may be touching surfaces, the copy machine, door handles, and thinking that's fine, my hands are clean but then they're touching their keyboard, they're touching their cell phone. Now the germs they've picked up on door handles and the copy machine, now it's on their cell phone. So once they remove their glove, their cell phone now potentially is contaminated. People may be less likely to wash their hands before, you know, after they remove their glove. And for office employees who may not be uh, aware of the proper technique to remove glove, while removing their glove, they may be touching the outside of the glove and now contaminating their hands and not thinking that they should go and wash their hands. So gloves in the office as, you know, if for companies who have tried, it's not working very well. But it's more important to wash their, your hand. Uh, unless you have a wound on your hand, the virus is not getting inside the, you know, the epidermis of the skin. It's what you do with your hand touching your face and then it can go through the mucous membrane. Yeah, that, that good hand hygiene and washing hands, uh, no matter what, is still going to be something that everyone needs to remember to practice. Um, so when, you know, looking at from a building perspective and the, the airflow in these buildings, do you recommend that um, there's anything done with the HVAC systems regarding, you know, decontaminating air? So there is a recommendation to increase airflow and maybe install filters in a healthcare setting where there's, you know, a patient with COVID-19 and generation of aerosol, but not in a regular workplace. Mm -hmm. Okay. So back to the face masks, because again, that is now coming up more and more. Um, do you recommend that people wear face shields in addition to cloth um, masks in the lab? So face shield will protect your face in case uh, of a splash of something. Um, so you could you know, have a facial in addition if your work mandates it, you know, because there's other potential hazard. For instance, if you are working with uh, human specimen that are from patient, like respiratory sample, um, the recommendation is to work in the biosafety cabinet. And, um, but it, you know, the recommendation is also that if you don't have one, you could potentially uh, work with uh, the material on the open bench with uh, a mask and a face shield. Uh, if you don't, you're not going to generate aerosols. Uh, but face shield, I have some utility if you have a mask underneath, if there's a chance of splash. Um, also, the, your eyes is, could be also a potential entry point where, you know, the, the, the tear duct where connecting with the nose. So if you have them, the light one that are disposable, 
um, if you have to get within six feet of someone and you can always add a face shield, uh, it's all based on risk assessment. You have to look at wh what are you doing, what type of work you're doing, and then make a decision on PPE. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> you know, as we get back into the workplace and, and potentially have, you know, times when a, a, an employee is going to test positive, you know, we talked about the cleaning and the fogging, um, and, you know, it's not recommended that people buy their own foggers, but, you know, if an employee comes in and they test positive, they've only been in one room, you know, the cleaning seems more straightforward, disinfecting surfaces, um, but what do you, what should clients do, for example, if, you know, they're, they've been in the Cuban office area um, in, in open spaces and they've you know, walked around the facility and it hasn't really been con contained to one particular area? That's a very difficult question to answer because you know the guidance is to leave the space for 24 hours, presumably so that any droplets will resettle. The same way as when we talk about a biological spill at BL2 where you, you wait for the droplets of the aerosol to settle. But this will be very difficult because presumably we will have, you know, in all, all the workplace, um, there will be people who test positive. And, um, you know, recently we heard about Walmart recently where they, you know, nobody could go in there for, I don't know how much time. I don't know if it's a day or two when they did major cleaning, but this is bound to happen more often. So um, my thinking is stay tuned on additional guidance from the CDC on that. Because I'm thinking if this is going to happen more often, you, you could maybe see something is open and then close and open and close. So, um, once we also need to find out more about the virus, I think. Or it seems, you know, we're getting new information every day. And I know given the, you know, from your perspective, sitting in the QRT chair and, and overseeing a lot of the client work and the, the material that's rolled out to clients, um, are you seeing that clients, at least now, what they're thinking about now is if someone comes into the workplace and has been positive, that now they're going to um, send all employees home for a certain amount of time to work, you know, to work from home again and resume that work from home for a little bit? That's a good question. And so I do have some guidance here in front of me, and it's really for healthcare worker. So, um, you know, right now that they, they're saying that uh, if someone is symptomatic with suspected or confirmed case, uh, they should wait three days before returning to work. Um, so after the, you know, after they have been away for at least 10 days. So, I mean, that's a long time. And so who knows what's going to happen. Uh, and for the people who don't have any symptoms, uh, but they are positive, they, uh, the suggestion is for them to be away for 10 days from work, or um, and if they can get a test, it's two tests, 24 hours apart of respiratory specimen that comes back negative. So I think it's gonna be very hard, and uh, honestly, I'm not sure what it's gonna look like um, when maybe there are more people who come up positive. Uh, also, we may find out once we have a good, reliable antibody test, and we know what that means to be, uh, to have antibodies, whether or not we're gonna be immune for a short time or long time, who knows what that's gonna mean. Maybe we'll have result and we'll, we'll have a pass, we can go to work, I don't know. Right, uh, you know, the, uh, everyone's gonna be wearing a bracelet or <laughs> a green bla bracelet. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're nearing towards the end of our time together with our clients, um, you know, as, Lauren alluded to earlier, we're working with our clients to put these COVID back to work policies in place. Um, and, you know, those policies are also very customized and we want to, you know, work with you to customize those, including providing signs and um, postage and various communications throughout your facility. So safety partners you know, is, is ready to do that to help our clients. But maybe if there, you know, we, we end with if there's one or two maybe tips or strategies for the biotech community to think about, you know, best handling shifting back to work. Uh, I would say um, maybe doing some assessment of your facility. I think workplaces will change. I mean, everybody's been saying that. So maybe an assessment of your space before returning um, and staying up to date with all the guidance that's continually changing. Mm. 
yeah, that's that's the biggest challenge is as it changes, making sure you're you're on top of that and putting that in place. Well, well, Caroline, this was great. Thank you very much. I want to turn it back over to Lauren uh, for some closing remarks. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Caroline. I hope everybody enjoyed this webinar. I hope everybody got their questions answered. Um, as Jennifer said, Safety Partners is working hard with our clients as they're evaluating and creating their policies for returning to work. Um, if you have any questions about how we can help you, you can reach out to your consulting safety officer or reach out to me directly um, or reach out to us through the info mailbox at Safety Partners. Our next webinar will be next week, next Friday the 15th, and that will be a bit uh, more topic focused on uh, questions about PPE in the lab and the office. So we hope you'll join us for that. That invitation will go out tomorrow and be on the lookout soon for transcripts of this call and our two previous webinars. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.